What's up everyone, it's Animage here, and with the kickoff of the PXG and Bastard Mushroom match drawing near, we are inching closer and closer to the U20 World Cup arc. And with the U20 World Cup arc being right around the corner, I want to go over what we as fans can expect from it, and then later predict what exactly will come after what should be the biggest arc in the series. This video will be divided into two parts, with part 1 focusing on the possible events of the U20 World Cup, and part 2 focusing on the future of Blue Lock after the U21 World Cup. And with all that being said, let's get right into the video. The first stage of the U20 World Cup arc will of course be the group stage. In real life, the 24 teams participating are divided into 6 groups, with the top 2 teams of each group, and the first and the 4 best 3rd place teams advance to the round of 16. Now this might be a little bit confusing for the writers and the readers to keep up with, so I could potentially see the writer um, adding eight more teams so that we can get eight group stages with the top two teams from each stage, from each group moving to the round of 16. Um, that being said, the formation of the group stage doesn't really matter. What matters more is how the groups are divided. Where we are in the series right now, we only know of three countries with a world-class U20 player that will most likely play a important role in this arc. France with Loki and potentially Charles, Italy with Don Lorenzo, and Germany with Michael Kaiser. And I think that these three teams will play in separate groups from Japan. With the top two teams from each group moving on to the, to the round of 16, you could potentially introduce another super team into the group that Japan is in while still making, making sure Japan makes it past the group stage. Let's use Argentina as an example since they're the nation with the most U20 World Cups victories. The writer can have Japan beat, two, beat the two teams that end up being, being eliminated from the group stage and then having them face a devastating loss to Argentina to show that the road to winning the World Cup will be tougher than they think. After making it through the group stage with the other four, with the other four major teams from this arc, Japan is put into the knockout stage where losing means the end of their U20 journey. The first round of knockout stage will look something like this, with random teams filling out the empty spaces. Since Argentina was in the same group as Japan, they are on the other side of the bracket, which means that they want to face off against the team that beat them, against the one team that beat them in the group stage, they have to make it all the way to the finals. Now obviously, they were planning on doing that anyway, but this provides them with another rival that they have to consider for this arc. Obviously, all five teams will make it past the first round and move on to the quarterfinals, where we'll hopefully see a matchup between Italy and Germany. So where they move, I will have Japan's match happen first in the story, where they move to the semifinals, meaning that Kaiser wants to face off against Isagi and prove he's better than him. They'll have to get past the one man who was able to shut him down for almost an entire match, Don Lorenzo. And yeah, if I had it my way, we would see this match play out in the story. I mean, that matchup in the NEL was the first time we saw two new Gen 11 players go up against each other. Because this story is primarily told from Misagi's point of view, the matchup mainly played out in the background. We desperately need these two to be the main focus of a match in the U20 World Cup. I feel like this would be the biggest letdown in the series if we don't see these two have their rematch. But um, anyway, in the end, I will have Kaiser beat Lorenzo so that he can face off against Misagi in the semifinal in the semifinals, while France faces off against Argentina. From here, there's a lot of ways you could take the story. You could have Germany beat Japan, where they will either face off against French or Argentina for third place, while Germany faces off against the winner of French, or Arge of French and Argentina. But for this video, let's just say that Japan is able to beat Germany to face off, to make it to the finals of the World Cup. By the way, if anyone's wondering why I have Japan facing off against Germany in the semifinals instead of the finals, um, just like Karasuno had to beat their biggest ri rivals over Josai to face off against the true boss, the true final boss of Haikyuu in one of their tournaments, I'm having Asagi beat his biggest rival to face off against the true final boss of the U20 World Cup, which I would have beat French. That's right, I have Loki and French beating the team that beat Asagi during the group stage. Um, in, one of my, in one of my early videos predicting the match between PHG and Bastion Munchen, I said that, Lo that Loki would outplay Noah and Noah, showcasing that he had the potential to become the number one striker in the world 
thereby creating another rival for Isagi during the U20 World Cup arc. Now, now, whether Isagi beats Loki in the finals or not doesn't really matter. What matters is what happens afterwards, or if anything happens afterwards. And this is where we have to discuss the future of Blue Lock after the U20 World Cup arc. There are three options for the series after the U20 World Cup. Option one, the U20 is the final arc of the series and the story ends with Japan winning the U20 World Cup. This to me is the most unsatisfying option even if Japan wins. You see, there are two overarching stories within this series. The first story is how Blue, how the Blue Lock Project creates a striker that can lead Japan to the World Cup trophy. And the second story is how Isagi becomes a number one striker. If you end the series after the finals of the U-20 arc, neither one of these stories gets a proper conclusion. Now, I'm not trying to make the U-20 World Cup seem like a smaller achievement than what it is. But the actual World Cup is way bigger than the U20 World Cup. Ask anyone on the street who won the most recent World Cup, and there's a good chance that they'll know the answer. But if you ask those same people who won the U20 World Cup, they probably will respond by saying that they didn't even know that the U20 World Cup or the World the U20 World Cup existed. As for Isagi, even if he beats a player like Loki, who has the potential to become the world's number one striker, you can't really be the best until you beat the best. And that leads me to the second option, a time skip. After losing the U20 World Cup, we get a time skip. We time skip a couple years to the match between Asagi and Japan against Noah Noah and French in the finals of the World Cup. Not only does this provide the story with a more satisfying conclusion by having Asagi beat the world's number striker by winning the rematch against the team that beat him in the U20 match, we also we can also get a glimpse of of other, we can also get a, we can also get glimpses of where other major blue lock players are in their life. We can see what clubs are playing for now, what trophies and other accomplishments they achieved, and who had to take an alternative path in soccer as a coach or personal trainer due to a career any injury. But I'm sure nothing like that will ever happen. As for option three, and I'll admit that this is wishful thinking on my part, we could potentially get a sequel series where we can get arcs that the writer can't really go over in the current series, like a Champions League arc. On the Olympics arcs. As I said, there are two overarching stories in the current Blue Lock series. And those two arcs and the two and the two arcs that I suggested don't really add anything to those stories, making them unnecessary. So we probably won't get them. But if the writer creates a sequel series, he can give us different overarching to he can give us different overarching stories that could warrant these arcs. This option gives us the pros of a time skip while also putting more focus on the Blue Lock players' professional careers at the clubs they choose after the NEL. As I said, this option is complete wishful thinking since it's largely unnecessary for the story as a whole, but I would love to see this. Um, if you ask me, the most likely option is the time skip at the U20 arc. But what do you guys think? I would love to hear your thoughts on the future of Blue Lock, so let me know your opinions in the comments down below. That's all I have for you guys today for this video. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you leave it a like, share with your friends, and hit the subscribe button with post notifications on so you never miss another video from me. With all that being said, I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.